Hello everybody, I'm uh, Paul Beckwith and I'm walking along the uh, Rideau Canal in Ottawa. Very uh, crisp and cold day, uh, just a few days before Christmas. So I wanted to uh, just have a chat about uh, what's been happening in the climate recently and about um, just about, uh, you know, what's going on in, in uh, life. So basically, uh, just yesterday, I filmed a video with uh, Meta Spencer, Science for Peace, um, and uh, Trying to Save the World. Um, she interviewed, uh, well, chatted with both uh, Peter Wadhams and myself, mostly about methane. So I'll talk about uh, what's going on with methane right now. Uh, levels are extremely high in the Arctic and uh, we have to be concerned about the, um, about, about emissions coming up, not from burning fossil fuels, right? Uh, you know, people tend to think that, okay, we just need to slash fossil fuel combustion and uh, reduce emissions and then we, levels will stabilize you know, in the atmosphere. But the problem is, is with the warming that's uh, entrenched and built into the system already, the uh, danger is that this, the sinks of uh, greenhouse gases, you know, the oceans, the uh, forests, etc., cetera, um, you know, they start failing. And then basically emission, basically levels of greenhouse gases and continue to rise at ever faster rates in the atmosphere and it's almost like the the climate crisis is taken out of people's hands the only cards we have to play will be solar radiation management and carbon dioxide removal and methane removal active methods like that otherwise you know we're heading off we're rocketing up into a much much warmer world so you know, there's been lots of different uh, climate catastrophes, climate disasters occurring around the world. Um, great increases in the frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events. Plus, they're happening in regions where they didn't happen before. And this is due, as you well know, by because the Arctic is warming at much, much faster rates than the rest of the planet. And that slows the jet stream. It becomes much, much wavier in the north-south direction. It gets stuck in place and it leads to a world of grief, essentially. And uh, when we get, you know, we're heading basically to lower crop yields. And when we get simultaneous crop failures from extreme weather events, say in the next five to 10 years, we'll be in a situation of food shortages, food price spikes, possibly even famine. So this is where we're heading. The root cause, of course, is the greatly warming Arctic. Now, the American Geophysical Union Conference was on all last week. So last week, you may have noticed a large uptick in the number of climate stories. Some that stand out is maybe the collapse of Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica in less than five years, you know, with a half meter sea level rise just from that. Um, and, you know, there was lots of other climate stories. The Arctic report card came out and I'll talk about that in detail in a separate video as I'm sitting in front of my computer analyzing the graphs and the results from that report card which came out, but lots of other stuff on methane, on wildfire connection to the Arctic, etc. And a paper came out and it clearly shows that the Arctic is warming at a rate about four to five times faster than the rest of the planet, than the global average. And, you know, it's been, for years I've been saying four to five times faster, but the mainstream media source and scientists that aren't studying this area of research 
steps outside their field. They'll just quote what's said in the media and what other scientists are being quoted as saying. And that was that the Arctic is doubling. You know, the rate of warming in the Arctic is double that of the rest of the planet. And then some articles actually went and said three times faster, but essentially the true number is four to five times faster. If you go up to the high Arctic, it's even, it, the warming rate is even, even more. This is, uh, like I said, the Rideau Canal system. And over there is the uh, Lansdowne Park and the, the, the uh, football stadium. Once I get out of the trees, I'll show you a clearer view of the uh, stadium. Okay, so the warming of the Arctic is enormous. And when we lose Arctic sea ice, right, the sea ice keeps it cold in the Arctic because the heat energy goes into melting ice as opposed to heating, raising the temperature. This is a difference between latent heat, stored heat, and uh, sensible heat, which raises the temperature. So when the Arctic uh, sea ice is gone, then the Arctic warming will spike up. How much? You know, well, four to five times faster right now than the rest of the planet is the warming. And with no sea ice, I would expect that number to be... I'd have to, I have to try to calculate it better, but my gut feeling is that the warming in the Arctic will increase and it'll be at least 10 times faster than the rest of the planet. I would expect even... 15 to 20. That would be my back of the envelope guesstimate, if you like. But uh, I'll try to refine that number uh, based on, on the studies that I can find. And there's not a lot on that. So when that happens, of course, the jet stream will be unrecognizable and these weather extremes will ramp up even more. And we're certainly getting a huge number of these weather extremes even with the current warming, you know, which, you know, 1.1, 1.2 degrees Celsius above the 1900 or 1880 to 1910 average. Now, of course, you need to add at least 0.2. Some studies show 0.3 degrees Celsius to those numbers to convert the baseline from the 1900 to 1750, which was the original pre-industrial baseline, which is referenced when the uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius guard bands came out, um, you know, most famously the 1.5 at the Paris Agreement. So basically, just look at the trends of the temperature rise, and we're going to blow past 1.5 in uh, within a decade, you know, by 2030, and we'll blow past 2 degrees by 2040, and that's... Uh, relative to the 1900 baseline okay so if you're if you're if you want to go back to 1750 where it'll be much sooner than those years i've said and in fact we've had a whole month and you know months at a time already exceeding the 2050 number if you're talking about the 1750 baseline so weather extremes galore so base basically weather whiplashing Weather wilding and weather weirding will further increase in our climate casino. And if you're unlucky in the climate casino, you live in a place where you say lose your house to flooding or wildfire, lose your business, your workplace, in fact, lose your entire town or entire region. So lots of climate grief is happening in all kinds of different places. There's a better view of Lansdowne. Of the, uh, they built a wooden structure around the stadium in Ottawa there. Um, so, and if you, you know, this is happening, this loss of livelihoods, loss of entire ways of life, whether it be in, whether you're in British Columbia and have been exposed to multiple atmospheric rivers, coming and washing out mountains, passes and roads, and rail and infrastructure, and then causing flooding of vast regions. Or if you're in uh, the US, uh, Kansas, 
Can or Kentucky and many other adjoining states where there was tornado swarms in December just a few weeks ago causing vast destruction that it looks like an atomic bomb took out entire regions. You know, huge devastation, people losing everything. You know, a lot of these houses there, they don't have basements. So the entire structure was carried off of the uh, cinder block, the, uh, off the cement uh, foundation with no basement. And, uh, you know, and then it's gotten cold there. So people there in that region have actually been burning some of the debris from their tornado destroyed homes in order to stay warm as the temperatures have plummeted there. Okay, so there's a gorgeous view here. We've got the canal here. And then over here we have the Lansdowne Stadium, the football and soccer stadium with a wooden structure kind of enveloping on top of it. So anyway, we've got a nice view here. Um, this is looking south. And then uh, this is looking north uh, down into downtown Ottawa, the, through the Glebe and downtown Ottawa. But again, the stadium is uh, gorgeous. It's a nice clear day, very, very cold. Okay, uh, so if you're in the Philippines, uh, they've just experienced another massive typhoon, which has killed hundreds and hundreds of people and displaced, I don't know, what was it, 600,000 people I think I saw, you know, just before Christmas from their homes. So, these extreme weather events are generating climate refugees around the planet and there's so many things that people have that are being destroyed. If they get away with their lives, they lose everything and there's uh, a lack of any insurance for most people so they just, they're driven into poverty essentially, climate induced poverty. So this is going to happen more and more as insurance companies just uh, go bankrupt and, you know, are unable to insure anymore. And I guess the question always comes in is how many times do you rebuild? You know, if, you're, if New Orleans is destroyed, okay, it's rebuilt. What if it's destroyed again and then rebuilt and destroyed again? Like it, it'll, it'll bankrupt uh, governments, municipal state or fed state and federal governments and uh yeah i mean this is just where we're heading uh because of our human idiocy to address the problem you know as long as we continue to subsidize fossil fuels to the tune of 5.9 trillion dollars per year which works out to what 11 million dollars per minute i have to check that number that's what i red or was it an hour anyway some huge amount huge amounts of money it's like an endless pipeline of dollars to the fossil fuel industry so <coughs> i hope it's i don't think that cough is uh is is covid um this virus the omicron or omic omicron um it seems it's a perfect example of exponential growth. Climate disruption is increasing exponentially, but Omicron is, is like I said, with a perfect example of super exponential or hyper exponential growth. The doubling rate of this virus many places is two to three days, 2.8 days in Ontario, I think, um, before measures are, are uh, before everything's locked down, uh, about two days in the UK, it's just phenomenal multiplication. The virus, the you know. But I ask yourself, what would be the I what would the ideal vaccine look like? The ideal vaccine would build the antibodies in people's bodies to fight the virus, so that it didn't harm the person. Well, this virus, you know, this variant, Omicron, has such a high spreading rate and it has an extremely low 
fatality rate. This is a virus that's not killing people. There's a perfect scientific explanation for why this is happening. Okay, this variant multi is it, ex it multiplies in the upper respiratory tract of the human body, the throat, by a factor 70 times higher rate than all the other variants. Okay, it's R value, if you like, is four to five, whereas the cumulative R value of all the other variants is 1.37. So it, it's an upper respiratory tract or throat virus effect, and that causes cold-like symptoms, coughs, etc. The amazing thing about this virus is that, apart from the transmission rate, is that it multiplies in the lungs, you know, you know the deep in, inside the respiratory system, at a rate 10 times slower than all of the other variants. Okay, so your lungs don't get as congested and the throat does, and because it's in the throat, it spreads like crazy with an extremely fast doubling period. But because it doesn't get deep inside the body, it's not causing the breathing problems inside the lungs and the mortalities. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, this virus like any other flu or cold, can kill people. You know, if you're on your last legs, a puff of wind can finish you off, or, you know, the, this, the Omicron can finish you off. If you're vulnerable and you, you know, this, or, you know, if you have uh, high blood pressure and diabetes and you've had two heart attacks and, you know, you had a stroke a few years ago and you're 85 and you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day and drink a case of booze a day, okay, you get this virus or a puff of wind and it can finish you off and your death could would then be attributed to the virus. So there will be that, those cases, but this is something it doesn't want to kill people, okay? It's, uh, there's something in biology where if you take the transmission multiplied by the virality or the lethalness, it's some sort of constant, or it doesn't change much. So the fact that this thing is so transmissible, it's, it's going to become almost ubiquitous. I don't see how any other variant can, can come in with this variant. So I suspect, I'm not a virologist, but I suspect what we're seeing is the end of the pandemic in a few months. There's no way you can have a growth rate as large as what you have with this virus and it be around for a long time. So it's uh, zipping through the population. Christmas is perfect for spreading it around even more. Those growth rates will at least continue into the new year, but then it's, it will have infected so many people, they built up this herd immunity, and then the thing will die out, and that'll be it. No more masks, so there you go. That's what I think is going to happen. You know, I heard Biden had, had, had was promising to uh, that the U.S. would produce half a billion uh, rapid tests. You know, rapid tests are in huge demand right now, especially with Christmas. You know, if people have the sniffles or whatever, they want to test themselves to make sure it's not the coronavirus. Or if they're going to visit elderly people, relatives, etc., they want to test themselves before so they don't bring harm to these people, so it can allow them to celebrate their Christmas. I had plans to go and see my mother, who's uh, getting up there, almost 90, and uh, my mother-in-law uh, with the family, but we've canceled those plans because I have three boys, and my youngest is finishing high school, and somebody in his class was tested positive so his whole class has been isolating for 10 days I think he's on about day eight of that um, and uh, I've, I have a lot of these uh, rapid test kits because uh, they were free and and uh, what it distributed widely in, in Scotland as well as the rest of the UK so I brought back some uh, a bunch of them to uh, 
you know, test myself and friends and people for Christmas. That was the idea, and they're coming into high demand now, and I'm doing that. But, uh, you know, my son Edward, Edward is, is pretty much in the clear, so I think he's okay. He's nearing the end of his quarantine. And uh, my son Matthew, one of his roommate's friends, tested positive just about three or four days ago, so I brought a whole bunch of test kits over for him to test and for his roommates to test and yesterday I just picked up my third son Neil from Trent University where he's studying environmental chemistry and uh, things they're pretty you know before I drove him and his friend back I tested both of them of course these tests are uh, so but I think this is sort of a ubiquitous variant this is this is like nature's vaccine nature's way to end the pandemic all pandemics end. It takes them about two years. We're two years. This is the fifth wave. You know, people, it's all doom and gloom. It's what people are saying right now. But I, I really believe that that uh, this variant is the last one we'll see. And yay, 2022, no more pandemic in uh, two or three months. Well, no, this is an easy prediction. You know, let me know. I'm sure you'll all let me know if I'm wrong, but... Uh, it's, that seems to be the way things are going right now. Mortality rates have not been increasing significantly. They're extremely low in South America, South Africa, right where the thing started, in Denmark, in countries that had the rapid wave. And in fact, the, the big spike of cases in South Africa has petered out and is, the number of cases is starting to fall. Uh, just as rapidly as it rose there. So I fully expect to see that in all other countries. I guess if it falls too quickly, then there may be some other variants coming into play, but there's no way that any of these other variants could possibly compete with the uh, spread of the, of the uh, Omicron. And like I say, you know, it, it, it's only a upper respiratory tract throat sort of thing where it multiplies 70 times faster than all the other variants and it multiplies 10 times slower deep in the lungs so your lungs don't fill with fluid you don't get the flus and pneumonias and uh, you know you recover from a, a cold your the the symptoms are much much milder but like I say if you're on your last legs in your life right if you have a myriad of other complications and factors you know a puff of wind can uh, take you out as could uh, you know getting the Omicron and it would be counted as an Omicron death and it's like those numbers are when they report fatalities I think they really need to talk about other conditions like if a person dies of the virus Okay, well, they had diabetes, they weighed 450 pounds, they had high blood pressure and three heart attacks in the last few years, plus a couple strokes. And, uh, you know, those conditions should be mentioned and then they were finished off by the virus, right? Instead of panicking everybody saying that, you know, this death is just due to the virus, okay? Anyway, back to climate. Of course, we're gonna get more and more of these strains but like I said, all pandemics end. You know, the Spanish flu, one of the biggies, killed millions and millions of people. What, 10 million, 20 million, more than World War I, I think. And it ended after about two years. We didn't have vaccines then. And transport around the world was much slower by ship and train and uh, Zeppelin. And, uh, you know, airplane, airplanes came in later. Right? We certainly didn't have the global travel that we have now. Which some of my friends are telling me, this thing will never end. The virus will never end. It will just keep getting new ones, and that's it for society. And I think that's uh, bollocks is the term in the UK that I would use to describe uh, that, those ideas. Okay, so ah, we have a protest at my bank. This is awesome. 
Thank you. Yeah. No, I know. RBC is one of the worst. Yeah. They're okay. they're one of the biggest investors in the tar sands. So, thank you. Yeah. This is the. Uh, anyway, people over. People and planet over profits. There you go. I'm filming a climate change video, oh, nice. so no pipe plans. Good stuff. Okay, so there we are. Protests everywhere. People concerned about climate. Okay, so, so these extreme weather events are definitely ramping up and they're going to continue to ramp up and when we lose the Arctic sea ice, they're gonna, they're gonna uh, go vertical, right? They're gonna spike up and there's certainly no normal, right? Normal is chaos, but the level of chaos is, is ever increasing and will spike up when we lose Arctic sea ice, which is where we're trending to happen. And emissions of methane are already rising to alarming levels this year especially in the winter. You know, as winter settles in the Arctic, the emissions are going way, way up. And uh, it's because of all the breakdown of organic matter that's, you know, percolating in the uh, permafrost and, you know, in regions in the upper levels of the ground that are near zero degrees Celsius. Now, so where are we heading next? Okay, well, let's talk about the atmospheric rivers a bit. And I talked in depth with Meta Spencer about this. She kept asking me, well, what's good? What can I say that's good? I should have told her, well, the pandemic's ending. That's good. Climate, well, stay tuned until politicians get off their asses and get out of the pockets of the fossil fuel industry and governments around the world, which taxpayers, of course, fund, that money just goes straight into to the tune of 5.9 billion trillion dollars per year into fossil fuel subsidies which are then destroying everything that we hold dear on this planet including you know the plants the animals and ourselves it's really degrading our you know we're killing our our uh, lifeboat earth essentially this rock hurling through space is turning more and more into a rock and you know less and less from a thriving biosphere so anyway these atmospheric rivers okay it's not a new phenomena it's been around a long time okay it's just that Canadians hadn't heard of that term because you know people in BC had never heard of that term it became a new term like the, the Canadian term of the year atmospheric river which very few people had heard of, but California has been getting these things for years. In fact, one of them is called the Pineapple Express. You know, it's hot, humid, near tropical air coming up, uh, being, you know, stretching for thousands of kilometers or miles in a narrow band, connecting the moisture from the ocean the evaporated water onto the land like a fire hose and uh, been hitting California for years. When, it, when those torrential rains fall on scarred land that was exposed previously to wildfires, it causes uh, landslides and huge problems in California. Well, the oceans are warmer. The distribution of heat in the oceans has changed. There's more warmer water further north there's big pools of water the water is warmer to much greater depths it's not just sea surface temperature so not only does it fuel much larger superstorms cyclones typhoons hurricanes etc and the temperature contrast causes tornado swarms in december that are unprecedented okay it's uh these atmospheric rivers have, there, have moved further north and have been hitting Canada, you know, British Columbia, in the last uh, few months, causing catastrophic damage. So it's not, 
you know, logic 101. What's going to happen next is the warming continues and continues in north. Well, these atmospheric rivers will start heading into the Arctic. If there's still sea ice, they'll take it out. If there's no sea ice and the Arctic is much warmer, these atmospheric rivers will extend much further into the Arctic. So let's imagine a few atmospheric rivers, like the ones that hit BC, hitting Greenland. Okay, that water on Greenland, torrential rains on the ice cap on Greenland. Well, how does that sound? Because that's where we're heading. And when that happens, that water, of course, is heavier than the ice, so it undercuts through the ice goes down to the bedrock and lubricates and increases the speed of glaciers and it greatly increases melt rates. And uh, therefore, big chunks of Greenland slide off into the ocean and we get a, a uh, abrupt increase in sea level rise as we've seen in the sea level rise records at uh, you know various periods. And we get with that sea level rise and with the possible collapse of the Thwaites Glacier in uh, Antarctica and sea level rise, then the West Antarctic ice shelf in Greenland, in, in Antarctica, sorry, uh, the ice rises up from the bedrock and you get huge calving events and huge disintegration similar to the Larson B, Larson C, Larson D type events. So with a, when the sea level on the planet has increased by about say six or seven meters, about half of that sea level rise will be from, uh, not half, but maybe call it a third of the sea level rise will be from echo. Echo! Nice graffiti here in the tunnel here. Okay, uh, I'd say about half of the, a, a third of the sea level rise will still be from ocean expansion. And uh, a third will be from the Greenland glaciers. And a third will be from Antarctica glaciers. So, you know, if you get the Swaites Glacier in Antarctica calving and breaking up, rising, raising sea level, half a meter in a very short period of time, then that will greatly undercut Greenland glaciers and uh, cause them to have a greatly accelerated melting, which will increase sea level rise, feeding back to Antarctica and so on. You get the picture. Okay, we're in for a much, much different world. And it's all happening very, very quickly. So uh, you can feel extremely fortunate that you happen to be living at a time when we're seeing these cataclysmic changes occurring on the earth. Um, so anyway, that's uh, my thoughts on the atmospheric rivers going into the Arctic are still ongoing and developing, but I think that's a natural progression of what's happening. You know, as the warming goes more and more northward and as we get Arctic warming from increased absorption of solar radiation because the re whole region is darkening, then I fully expect that these atmospheres... You know, the Arctic is heading to become a place with no snow and ice. And you know, I have to laugh. Uh, I saw Jason Box at the uh, Glasgow Climate Conference. In fact, I, I videotaped one of his talks. I don't think I've posted it on my video stream yet. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on ideas and big picture stuff. You know, how the whole systems are changing and reacting. So I haven't posted a lot of videos um, in the last couple of weeks, but I'll crank that up soon because there's a huge load of, of content from the AGU, American Geophysical Union Conference in New Orleans. And some of you might remember that I attended that 
and posted videos live from there just a couple of years ago. But it, it comes too close to COP, so if I go to COP, I probably can't go to that thing. It was also a virtual conference. There's a lot of information on that. My, my colleague, uh, Peter Carter, gave three presentations um, virtually to the American Geophysical Union. So, anyway, uh, yeah, so all of these things are happening, and, uh, you know, we should feel very privileged to be living today in 2021 and be the first humans in thousands of years to have experienced a completely destabilized climate and, uh, you know, there's going to be loads and loads of surprises, things that we don't expect, but um, you can say, hey, I expect these things. I'm not surprised when, you know, when, when atmospheric rivers go in and take out Greenland ice. I mean, anyway, what I was saying about Jason Box is, yeah, I'll post his presentation, but he's a, a great scientist. He's one who said that if, you know, Greenland melt rates goes way up, we're effed, you know, and took a lot of backlash from people. He said that a number of years ago. Kevin Anderson was also there at the conference in Glasgow, lots of other people. You know, I, 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 bumped, I saw John Kerry and the uh, Premier or Prime Minister of Italy and people, stuff like that. Didn't see Greta, unfortunately, saw her at the previous climate conference. But anyway, these things are all coming down the pipes and we should expect complete chaos in the climate system, you know, within the next few years to five years to decade, uh, making things pretty unrecognizable. Like I, again, I'll use that phrase, weather weirding, weather wilding, weather whiplashing in the climate casino. Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, if you look at the, look at the latest science, all the peer-reviewed, you know, so-called expert views on how long would it take to melt Greenland ice sheet, you know, and it used to be, you'd see numbers like a thousand years, 500 years, 300 years, you know, maybe if you saw a century, you know, you'd be, uh, I, I doubt you'd even see a hundred years, right? But imagine these atmospheric rivers becoming a uh, regular phenomena over Greenland, over the Greenland ice shelf, you know, then that, you know, scientific papers will be done. They'll say, oh, everything's happening much faster than we expected, you know, and then they'll say it'll take a hundred years for the Greenland ice shelf to melt. And then a few years later, they'll say, oh, 50 years, you know, a couple decades. Okay, so time will tell. Um, Anyway, I'm heading downtown, um, and uh, I'm heading to see, a lot of stuff is closing today, I gotta do a few last minute shopping things, be, the, be that good consumer. Actually, I have so many books, I was gonna give people books for the holidays, but like I said, we're just kinda hunkering down and staying put, you know, because uh, we don't wanna visit elderly people that are vulnerable. And uh, what else can I say? There was a whole bunch of other things I was gonna talk about, but I have to kind of pay attention to traffic. So anyway, I hope everybody has a very happy new year, you know, as we head into 2022. And uh, finally the the virus fatigue will end and, you know, great news. I bring you great news. Rejoice. You know, the pandemic will come to an end in a few months is, uh, you know, but of course, if it doesn't, I'll have to stop these being a uh, pretend virologist, you know, and defer to others. But you'll notice in all of the stories that you read about this thing, almost none of them talk about mortalities and death rate. So it's... Uh, yeah, anyway, 
that's a really that's the thing to delve into and dig into for your particular region. Uh, what else was I going to say? Um, I don't know. I'm uh, stay healthy, you know, stay happy, right? Just compartmentalize. Forget everything I just told you about climate, and uh, enjoy the holidays. And uh, you know, we can work at saving the world again uh, in the early new year. Um, I did a video with uh, my colleagues, my friends at the Climate Emergency Forum and managed to convince Charles and Heidi, who are behind the operation, to uh, go on and talk about their, uh, their experiences at the COP26 in Glasgow, along with, of course, you know, Regina and uh, Peter Carter, who was a virtual attender and uh, you know, my own views about it and also you know, watch the uh, Meta Spencer uh, video on sort of the end of the year video that I did with uh, Meta and uh, Peter Wadhams. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll you know, make sure you go to my website, paulbeckwith.net. Con please consider a uh, you know, holiday donation to my website. And uh, let me know if I put out too much uh, content over the next uh, few weeks because I've got still loads of cop videos, it turns out. I forgot I hadn't posted the Jason Box one, but there's many other good ones too. There's one where I was walking into the cop and uh, Darth Vader was playing music and talking about marine cloud brightening and things. So he's singing and then... And then he said, he added my name into his song as I'm walking by. <laughs> so anyway, I'll post that one. He's a very famous guy, you know. So many people going into the cop saw him, uh, Jamie. So uh, yeah, so uh, what else? Uh, facingfuture.org, you know, make sure you check out them and their videos. And uh, also, um, if you want to challenge me to chess, you can find me often. Uh, if I'm not doing enough videos, I'm reading science, reading books, even fiction, mostly nonfiction. And uh, you can find me under my name on uh, Lee Chess, L I Chess, or on chess.com. And uh, challenge me to a game if you're so inclined. Although my rating is going much, much higher. My performance rating is over 2,500 in a lot of recent uh, uh, tournaments that I'm playing in, uh, Rapid Chess, which is five minutes for the whole game. Okay, thanks again, and uh, happy holidays. Okay, bye for now.